Hi, Sid. Uh, Hi, Stratis. Very nice to see you here. Yeah. Uh, I am Stratis Minakakis, and I'm joined by my colleague, Sid Richardson. Uh, we're both composers, and uh, we teach at New England Conservatory. Uh, recently, we had uh, an opportunity to have uh, two pieces of ours recorded back to back. So we thought we'd take this opportunity to uh, ask each other questions about uh, our works and kind of reflect on the creative process and the issues that uh, interest us uh, currently. So um, uh, Sid, we, uh, um, we heard a recording of your beautiful piece for solo piano, There is No Sleep So Deep. And I have uh, some questions about that. Uh, your your work often draws attention to the relationship between language and music. So you recently uh, released a CD, uh, Born by a Wind, where you engage uh, with texts by authors as diverse as uh, Chaucer, Whitman, and the contemporary American poet uh, Nathaniel Mackey. And he, of course, in uh, There Is No Sleep So Deep, the inspiration comes from Beckett's uh, Footfalls. I was wondering what interests you in the relationship uh, between music and language, which seems to be a recurring theme in your work. Yeah, it's uh, maybe the central theme um, in a lot of my music. And there's a lot of things that, uh, that come to mind. Um, I've always been fascinated by the written word, um, its ability to convey emotions and meaning, its plasticity within the confines of language, and uh, its multitude of forms. So um, there's, you know, a lot of very specific uh, things about syntax that in interest me, rhetoric, um, but also uh, the more poetic nature of of the relationship between um, literature and ideas, and then uh, literature and music, and uh, and for example. Nathaniel Mackey's poetry, which has been so influential uh, on my practice. Um, there's a lot of, of also this interplay between literature and music and a lot of focus on the sound of prosody and this mm -hmm. idea that um, the sounds of the words themselves betray an inner meaning that's maybe no less important than their syntax. Mm -hmm. uh, which and I he's, also, he's also a poet uh who sees that relationship from another perspective, right? Like his influence from jazz, for example. Yes, very right. much so. Yeah, so okay. bringing in, um, you know, his own signifiers uh, into his poetry, you know, um, specifically uh, pointing to a lot of different ethnographic practices from around the globe, uh, almost in this kind of kaleidoscopic um, manner, but also exactly um, referencing free jazz icons like uh, Sun Ra, and um, Eric Dolphy, John Coltrane, um, you know, a, a wide uh, spectrum, but also a lot of uh, musicians from, from many different uh, world practices around the globe. Um, and his, his work uh, was one, a springboard for um, a lot of the ways that I think about uh, poetic relationships between um, text, source text, and, and my music. And I'm very interested um, also very much in liminal spaces, interstices between uh, literature and music, the, the spaces that are, are less obvious uh, between the two. Particularly, you know, there's always a point where a literary metaphor, you know, ends and we, we're really in a musical realm. Um, so what are the elements of, of sound as it relates to literature that play out and how does that um, form a, how does that affect form in a musical sense is very uh, interesting to me. So in There Is No Sleep So Deep, there are uh, very distinct correlations between just, you know, big picture ideas that I've drawn from the Beckett text, this play Footfalls in the music, for example, um, the play describes a woman's uh, kind of slow withdrawal from life or we can't really tell if the protagonist, if it's all um, unfolding in her mind. There's another character that's off stage. That's her mother. Is the mother in her mind? Is she a ghost herself? You know, there's a lot of different ideas uh, at play, but one of the central elements is this very visual aspect of 
the protagonist pacing up and down the stage. And that pacing gesture plays out uh, very importantly in, in the fast music in the piece uh, that kind of paces up and down the keyboard in a very narrow ambitus. Um, but so that's, you know, a very poetic resonance there. Um, and there's an emotional res resonance there as well in that I wrote this uh, work as a memorial for my grandmother who had recently passed away. And, you know, I'm working out my grief through the work, but there's also this relationship um, in the play uh, to an older woman and several, you know, layers, many layers of context uh, and emotional resonance there. But there's also more musically concrete um, ideas that are at play. For example, word lengths from the original script um, control, you know, where articulations and emphases fall in the fast music, where uh, and punctuation controls where pauses are. Um, there's substitution ciphers where, you know, commas might um, signal a 16th note rest, whereas a period full stop might signify uh, a quarter note rest and, and things that I don't intend necessarily for the listener to mm -hmm. pick up on and uh, perceive, but that are important for my uh, compositional and pre-compositional practice. Yeah. And, um, and that I find interesting mm -hmm. kind of layers that are, are both concrete or more poetic and then everything in between subconscious uh, understandings of, of how ideas like timbre uh, come into play. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, uh, Beckett uh, seems to attract uh, composers. <laughs> uh, yes, I was thinking, for example, of uh, Kurtak's uh, Fan de Partie, like based on uh, Endgame. Uh, Feldman, uh, we discussed, you brought to my attention to Sapin uh, as well. And uh, I, I was wondering what uh, uh, what is your relationship uh, to make it. Uh, you explained, I think, very well like that emotional connection to uh, you know, person's gradual withdrawal and how that you kind of associate it with the passing of your grandma. Um, I, yeah, I'm wondering to, to what extent other people's work on Beckett informs your own attitude uh, towards him. Uh, and also why Beckett uh, in particular, because it's not just the subject matter, you know, this idea of, of death or decline is a very common trope uh, in theater, but, but Beckett seems is a very particular type of theater. So I was wondering what is your connection to that? And also what is your connection to the body of work that has been done from other composers uh, with respect to Beckett? To Beckett? Yes, um, you're, you're certainly right that Beckett is you know, really his own ilk. Um, I came mostly to my interest in Beckett by doing research on uh, French composer Pascal Dussepin, as you mentioned, um, has a very strong connection to Beckett. He discovered him early on uh, and has written several pieces that um, directly connect um, to different works by Beckett. For example, I'm thinking of Watt, uh, the trombone concerto, um, quad in memoriam, Gilles Deleuze, uh, that's a violin concertino um, that relates to a television uh, play quad by Beckett that is for four actors. There's actually no um, no speech in this play. It's, it's for television. It's all uh, with just choreography playing out on a quadrilateral. I had done a lot of uh, research in my dissertation on that work in particular, and that led to you know interdisciplinary relationships between Beckett and Gilles Deleuze and 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 with uh, Dussepin, who has you know engaged with both these thinkers. And in terms of why Beckett, some of the things I'm interested in Beckett are this idea again uh, back to this this pacing idea of um, characters in Beckett going through these you know, very laborious machinations or uh, kind of neurotic processes that uh, they're engaging in, in turn, almost in a, uh, a Dante-esque um, way. So in quad, there's a, a transition 
there's the different players are tracing out very specific uh, choreographic um, entrances and exits on the face of this quadrilateral that we're seeing and it's accompanied by music. And then in Footfalls, the play that uh, informs There Is No Sleep So Deep, there's the, the pacing of the protagonist May up and down the stage has a very uh, mm -hmm. musical and, and also gestural um, idea that I, I latched onto. And in Beckett, I think there's this, this almost uh, connection to Sisyphus, the, you know, yeah. pushing the, the rock up uh, the, the hill for all eternity. There's this idea that um, Beckett's protagonists are, are engaged in a very similar kind of um, activity in, in the case of football is just pacing up and down the stage. Yeah. We learned that May has been, you know, doing this since uh, adolescence and, and has been the occupation of their existence. And, and we see this throughout Beckett, um, these characters who are, who are just engaged in a Dante-esque uh, loop of, mm -hmm. uh, that is, you know, approaching um, some some shift between sleep and wakingness, uh, you know, the horror of the light and the kind of s reprieve of uh, consciousness that that sleep brings, and the tedium of uh, postmodernism, the theater of the absurd that is also uh, wrapped up in all of these ideas um, interests me. Yeah, and so yeah. Beckett, I find, you know, an intriguing figure and and problematic, and. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested in in literature about uh, criticism of his works. I think I've I've gotten a lot of um, ideas. Almost, I believe Beckett is one of the uh, authors that's had almost the most criticism uh, produced. You know, trying to explain his work, and there's a lot of interesting um, connections that can be made between music. I'm, I'm also uh, thinking of Feldman's music, uh, his opera either uh, that sets um, Beckett's work and and a television or a radio play he did uh, with Beckett as well direct collaborations which were rare uh, with musicians uh, is my understanding yeah okay you, you know you mentioned this uh, idea of the uh, of the deep sleep or the reprieve, reprieve from wakefulness and I was thinking from a, a line in Homer uh, where Odysseus uh, is uh, returning to Ithaca to, to face the last part of his uh, battle to uh, reclaim his throne, yes. uh, draw yeah. the suitors. And um, Homer says that as he's uh, sleeping on the boat, the god sent him a kind of sleep that he, uh, he describes uh, uh, nigretos, uh, without waking, idistos, mm -hmm. uh, uh, very sweet, and uh, the the third one is very interesting. Thanato akisa uh, a cause like a very akin to death. Mm, uh, interesting. And uh, yeah, and that, that uh, this idea of the, there's no sleep so deep conjured that, that uh, in the imagination. It's we, we, you know when we perceive the the piano piece, uh, uh, the audience will be able to to hear the beautiful recording that Victor made uh, very soon. Um, we can perceive the, the, the interplay of, uh, let's say, the characters very clearly. You have this kind of uh, a temp almost a temporal kind of uh, signals. Uh, and then the, you have the obsessive uh, pacing gestures and then this other kind of beautiful uh, uh, Beautiful, beautiful uh, arpeggios uh, with gorgeous resonances, uh, and those are very evocative of the kind of things you describe in the text. Uh, but uh, still, like you know, this is not a, a literally a setting of the text. Uh, so the Beckett, the Beckettian uh, structures and themes are essentially a metaphor. Right, yes, so yeah. so the work must make sense on its own merit. Like that, that organism has to survive by itself, uh, irrespective of the text. Yes, so I was wondering, sure. how do you go about like kind of arranging those elements and kind of weaving that kind of narrative in the absence of the uh, in the absence of the text? Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's a great question. Uh, as you as you bring up, you know, there's always a 
a time when working with another art form where you uh, you depart from that solely and and you work in uh, the musical sphere, and you know there are these uh, are more connections to the different types of music. For example, the slow music that's um, more lush and and with the repeated notes is is kind of evoking parts of the play that uh, where may the main character is, is pacing and, and counting her paces and she's you know counting out one two three four and i was thinking about these and the, the repeated note gestures for example but again that's just uh you know a literary poetic resonance not um, a musical uh you know narrative and i i guess the way that i constructed the piece was to um kind of have an exposition where i i bring forth over the you know the first half of the work or maybe the first third, the different elements, uh, and we hear them at, you know, they're all in some way encapsulated harmonically in the very first gesture at very high in the piano uh, that encompasses an all interval tetrachord that, you know, has some of the, the most important um, intervals, for example, a minor third that we then immediately hear again, and that comes back uh, in different forms, different registers throughout the work. and. There's the fast pacing music, the slower counting music, uh, this sweeping gesture that I, I was thinking of kind of resetting um, the narrative as we go along. So each, I would say that each kind of music had a functionality uh, in my own mind. And then I was kind of, as we going for, as I was going forward in the work, I, I knew that I wanted to uh, increase the pace of juxtapositions between these different um, kind of musics and uh, have almost a disintegration of of the different structures as we approached um, kind of the more emotional weight of the work, which is this, this very dense um, piano chords that accumulate and uh, momentum as as they push forward. And I was thinking of this as you know really the crux of uh, the emotional content of my working out of my grief uh, over the loss of my grandmother, and then having so. It's almost a accumulation of different musics um, leading to a very formal weight. And then with a coda where after the uh, scrape on the low E string um, of the piano, I was, I was almost imagining um, the ending as, you know, uh, her soul departing to another plane or, or receding into uh, that deep sleep, another level of consciousness. Yeah. Very interesting, and I and all of that brings brings up the the idea of rhetoric, uh, you know, like there, yeah. obviously, as someone who is so uh, keenly interested in the, in the relation between language and, and music, and you have such a strong instinct uh, uh, for language and an interest in language from all kinds of periods. I mean, rhetoric inevitably comes up, and it's yeah. something that I think about a lot. Uh, in my music, but in music in general as well. Um, but I want to ask you something. When we when we think about rhetoric, the obvious connection that we make is to the music of the 18th and 19th century. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a lot of work that has been done on that. Uh, I I was lucky enough uh, when I was an undergrad, for instance, to study with Kofi Agao uh, and be introduced to the field of semiotics. Um, you know, when we when we when we're talking about the study of science, uh, for example, in uh, in classical Baroque music, there are of course all these kind of reference from social life, hunting calls, dance forms. You know, mm -hmm. these are real life experiences and situations for that kind of hierarchical society. Uh, that is something that's an experience that we can only appreciate academically today. You know, because yeah. we took a class. I don't think many yeah. of us. I definitely never heard horn calls, <laughs> haunted foxes, you know, maybe there's some members of the British aristocracy that still do that, but I think for most of us, it's not an experience we, we share. Um, but there's another aspect in kind of the study of sense, which is rhetoric. And I think that that is a very interesting, and a kind of somewhat problematic, misconstrued topic. Uh, Many composers, kind of the avant-garde, post fifties and avant-garde, would say that they are interested in forms and uh, material that uh, uh, is that antithetical to the idea of rhetoric. 
or goes against that kind of concept. And I wanted to ask you as uh, someone who obviously thinks about uh, uh, these kind of things uh, in a very interesting and personal way, uh, is it possible how to evoke rhetoric today without the without running back scared to the archetypes of the 18th and 19th century like rhetoric without sonata forms uh, yeah know. it's it's uh, an interesting problem i think that we're we're confronting uh you know in the wake of of modernism and and postmodernism that this kind of disintegration of of a lot of these um, signals are in, and different signs between that we can share is uh, between composers and and the audience and uh, performers, and it's it's an interesting problem. I'm not sure if I have a um, a real solution, but I think I find in in works like there is no sleep so deep. It's, it's important for me to to construct these uh, poetic resonances that I believe uh, are creating new connections and new uh, paradigms or new forms of rhetoric that. Um, maybe they do require some some level of, of explaining and uh, you know either through a program note or a talk like this to to really make the connection so maybe they're not as effective as some of these ideas like the horn call from the 19th century but that we there is a way forward in terms of constructing a narrative or constructing at least a narrative of forms um, of shapes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the music where we can um, you know, create an internal logic in each work that uh, leads the ear and the mind in in pathways. It, you know, I don't think we can ever really say in music because it, you know this is music. You can't really uh, create a narrative in your own, as even as the composer in your own work, that everybody is going to listen to and and you know perceive it that way, right? There, it's everybody is going to bring their own. Um, beliefs and their own backgrounds uh, to the music. And I think that's the beauty of, of our art form is this um, this kind of a personal and, and very, at the same time, very personal uh, relationship, this um, almost dialectic between, you know, bringing your own interpretations, but also I think it is the burden of, of the composer to, to think about the narrative and to think about new forms of rhetoric. And I, I especially admire uh, composers that I think engage with things like that. Uh, for example, I look to Kate Soper and, and George Lewis as two luminaries who have thought uh, a lot about rhetoric and maybe they're, they're hearkening back more to classical rhetoric, uh, maybe than 19th century forms, but you know, have thought a lot about this and found interesting ways to uh, directly confront it or obliquely uh, confront it. And I, it's you know an, an ever present uh, problem in our music. I think now that we have departed from uh, various things like tonality, sonata form, um, very helpful constructs in a lot of ways. You can see how these caught on and uh, were so influential in in art music. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a very interesting, a very interesting topic. I like I I often feel like people who are polemics of the idea of rhetoric in contemporary music uh, essentially are interested. They're they're not so much. Uh, against rhetoric itself but they're trying to invent new forms of rhetoric thinking think, you know, whether there's something kind of fundamental about uh, the communicative power of music that uh, ret rhetorical artifices come into uh, come into play yeah, yeah. so then my my last question for you has uh, to do with the choice of of instrument i, I understand that that was uh, uh written for Conrad Tao, who yes. I think is uh, one of the most extraordinary artists. Oh, I agree. Uh, active today. I mean, incredible, incredible. Incredible and, and inspiring uh, yeah. thinker yeah. as well. But but if we, let, let's talk a little bit about the piano, because the, the piano has, I mean, for many centuries, the piano was the paradigm for music, you know, like keep, uh, he, harmony at the piano, you know, like like they, it was basically, let's say, the canvas on which you learn the art of composing. Yes. Uh, at the same time, when we switch to the 20th century, the piano is also uh, an instrument in which some of the most important composers tried out their hand at new things. Like 
we think about like this whole business of post-tonality, of course, uh, like starting with, among others, uh, Schoenberg's uh, three piano pieces, Opus 11. We think of Bartok and his contributions, Weber, the, the variations, uh, uh, Stockhausen's Klavierstücke, uh, living composers, you know, like Wolfgang Riem, Klavierstücke, yeah. uh, Dussapin, the composer that you mentioned, and like from the recently departed ones, Milton Babbitt, when you think how important mm -hmm. piano uh, is uh, in his exploration, in his explorations, uh, Xenakis the same way. Think of a work like Every Ali, for example, which is yes. a masterpiece of uh, arborescences and all that. Ligeti piano etudes, but I, at the same time, so there's this ability of the piano to kind of address anything that has to do with harmony, with uh, yes. rhythms, with uh, 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 like a whole thing that are at the, a whole bunch of things that are at the core of composing. I uh, forgot to mention Lachenmann, another one, incredible uh, composer for the piano, perhaps the one who sees uh, the greatest uh, variety of characters in the piano. You know, you think of something like Eco Adante, which is a, like a masterpiece uh, study of resonance and also like Grido, which takes this hallowed instrument and, sorry, Gero that takes the this hallowed instrument and turns it to a, like, uh, like a, <laughs> a Grido, you know? Yeah. Uh, but, but at the same time, you know, there are so many things that us composers in 2021 are interested in. Like, for example, timbre, you know, I was very impressed with the way you use timbre in the CD Born by a Wind. There's uh, all this... Uh, like in uh, loons, like like the super super subliminal sounds that you're interested in at kind of the margins of perception. Uh, a lot of us, I think, both of us included, are interested in microtonality. Piano is not the obvious choice for this kind of uh, yeah, that's true uh, exploration. So I was wondering, how do you relate to the piano as an instrument, uh, given all this kind of interest that you have in timbre and harmony? Yes, it's. Uh... You know, there's, of course, all these limitations, as you, as you just described, um, in terms of especially, you know, microtonality, there's a whole problem there uh, that we can get around with scordatura and other, you know, extended keyboards and things like that. But, you know, for the real piano, um, even timbrely, it, it's maybe more limited than, than other instruments in terms of uh, variations in different registers, you know, with the modern piano, the Steinway piano. Um, one of the prides being that they're, you know, they've reduced some of the, the timbral variety from the pianoforte of, of the 18th, 19th century. Um, and so I think that is, you know, definitely provides um, some limitations and, and maybe constrictions uh, in terms of, you know, how we approach it if we're, you know, trying to evoke um, kind of more spectral ideas uh, or, you know, Certain certain phenomena related to acoustics that you know rely on microtonality or for more um, you know different harmonies and, and interesting ideas in form and other things, but at the same time I find that you know limitations like that can be uh, on the other side of the coin very um, very inspiring and and finding ways to work around that and still incorporate um, some of those ideas or maybe approximate them. Uh, can can lead to new and interesting avenues of research and, and music. And so, for example, in There Is No Sleep So Deep, um, effects of resonance and and overtones uh, do play into the work where I, you know, intervals from in the high register are flipped into the low register to create more uh, sonorous soundscapes that are, you know, harmonies are picked out in particular to try to highlight and approximate um, more you know, maybe spectralist ideas. But at the same, and then things like um, use of score to, uh, not score to Tura, but um, um, you know, different pedalings to, to enhance uh, particular resonances, uh, sustenuto pedal to, for example, in the accumulating uh, kind of thick chords, I'm holding out uh, several A naturals to kind of uh, give a an aura of of an overtone series around A to what is otherwise a very chromatic uh, language, and so I find um, it is again in terms of rhetoric, you know, limiting. We can't maybe use some of the uh, 
the gestures that uh, as growing, I grew up uh, playing piano, uh, my first instrument, and I never progressed to a, you know, a really proficient player, but there are still things under my fingers that I gravitate towards uh, that are more associated with, uh, you know, strictly classical or romantic periods that I might not want to um, engage with just for the associations uh, or even, you know, 20th century uh, cliches as we, as we've, um, you know, come to know them. So there are definitely, uh, it's, it's a tricky instrument to write for. Of course, if you're writing for Conrad Tao, who's just, you know, such a phenomenal player, it really gives you, I felt like I could really spread my wings and, and uh, write gestures that I could never play myself at, at speed. But, um, you know, writing for a phenomenal player, you can, you can kind of stretch your wings and uh, let your hair down. So I, I found that, uh, you know, very helpful, but I'd be curious to, to hear uh, what you think about um, the piano in the modern day and, and the challenges of, uh, you know, the modern composer bringing to uh, I, yeah. those works that you that you brought up, obviously, are almost a uh, tour de force list of, of interesting ways that that modern minds have confronted this issue. But yeah, it, it, it's something I've been thinking about a lot. I was also trained as a pianist, and I must say that it is uh, the instrument I'm scared the most to write for because <laughs> yeah, me too. Because of all that muscle memory that comes in, you know, like I still love to play. I love playing Beethoven, uh, mm -hmm. particularly Beethoven. You know, like I have a, a a sense that like at any time I have like ten different piano sonatas like in my hands. <laughs> yeah, they're amazing. But but uh, uh, yeah, what what is interesting to me now is to dis somehow disassemble the mechanism of the piano and reassemble it in a way that is counterintuitive. For example, like uh, disassociate the resonance from the attack. Of course, that can all be done with uh, electronic uh, means but it can also be done with uh, inventing new techniques and thinking about new ways of activating sound. Yeah, I was fascinated in that recent work that I heard of yours, uh, how you used ebos on the strings yeah. uh, in, in you know, coordination with pedalings to, to create very drone effects and, and yeah, you know, almost yeah. create a, a super instrument in a way. Yeah, and there are, there are uh, of course, like uh, uh, augmented instruments, like, uh, like the... Uh, uh, magnetic resonator piano that uh, a former uh, uh, colleague of mine, Andrew McPherson, uh, uh, invented and has done wonderful things with it. I, I, I personally am more interested in like good old, uh, you know, piano. Yeah. <laughs> even even like the, the like the mediocre piano, like my upright. What is it? How can I dissect and? Uh, reassemble the instrument and the sound uh, that goes to it. That, that is definitely um, one aspect. Um, there's a, a, a friend of mine who's a wonderful uh, pianist, Aaron Likeness. Uh, he's an extremely impressive pianist uh, for new music. He told me once, like, like eventually people that, uh, that write well for piano have something important to say about rhythm and harmony. And it sounds conservative until you like realize who is it that says it. You know, like he's, he's a, like a, a genius of contemporary piano, um, and and I think in a way that is right that you must have like a certain particular angle on harmony and, and rhythm to have something new to say about uh, about the piano. Um, mm. And for me, harmony is also timbre. Like I think of yeah. uh, timbre as an aspect of harmony. So very interesting, uh, very interesting instrument. And also, I mean, in all honesty, you deal with pianists, especially contemporary pianists, uh, uh, like established artists like Conrad or emerging artists like Victor, who played and recording the piece now, that are really incredible musicians. Yeah. yeah. Like, in terms of what Victor they can consider. Yeah, what they can conceive of, like the varieties of touch, and uh, uh, all that. So for me, it is also interesting not only the the instrument itself, but the musician who plays it. Uh, yes. For me, the like, pianists are 
maybe you and I are biased in this respect because of our training, but for me, they are the most holistic musicians because everything is accessible to them. You know, if they become, if they learn how to read score well, they can read uh, orchestral music. Uh, you know, they, they have essentially kind of like a global purview of the musical world. And there is, uh, uh, so, so like, how do you tap on some of the maybe aspects of musicality and musicianship that are hidden inside the pianist? Okay, engage, engage mm -hmm. the kind of person who plays the piano well. Yeah, that, that is uh, that is also very interesting to me. Yeah, a challenge. Yeah. Anyway, well, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Oh, it's it's geez, thank you so much. Piece. Yeah, and uh, pleasure to hear yours and to have them back to back was really, you know, especially these yeah. days to hear live uh, performances yeah, it was, in Jordan Hall was uh, a special <laughs> treat. <laughs> yeah. So um, thank you very much again. And I look forward to uh, sharing uh, this talk and uh, uh, our music with uh, everybody else. As do I. Thank you so much, Shruti. Right. Take care. You too.